Barbara. Thank you so much for that very warm introduction. And um, I'm very pleased to be here today to speak with you. Um, I do want to say, uh, before, I, before I speak, I don't want to forget to mention uh, the work of my students. A lot of what I'll present to you today is work that was conducted by uh, many of my graduate students, and uh, they're very responsible for uh, what you'll hear. So it's well recognized by scientists and by the public that as we age, we experience a decline in our cognitive or thinking abilities. So we sometimes forget names, we, our processing speed is slowered, slower, and questions about successful aging are of increasing importance given our growing population of older adults and also the trend towards staying in the workforce for longer, well beyond the traditional retirement age. Now, I wanted to speak to you quickly about the choice of title. Um, clearly, as time goes by, implies the aging process. But I chose this title for another reason. Some of you probably recognize this title as the title of a song that's famous from the movie Casablanca. And uh, it was played when Sam, at the request of Ilsa, asked for uh, this particular song, even though Rick, uh, played by Humphrey Bogart, asked that the song never be played again. And some of you may remember in very great detail actually watching this film, um, maybe even when it actually came out. And you might remember exactly who you were with at the time and maybe even what you were wearing, although that's probably unlikely. And the ability to remember past personal experiences, which is known as episodic memory, is an ability that is known to decline with age. And I will speak to you more about this in this talk. But there's also areas of uh, cognitive performance that are retained with age and sometimes even improve. And one example of this is semantic memory. So this is memory for facts about ourselves and facts about the world. So knowing that Julie Wilson played Sam or Humphrey Bogart played Rick, um, even knowing that the name Ilsa, um, Ilsa was played by Ingrid Bergman, the name Ilsa is German for Elizabeth. Those are all facts that we know, and we don't have to actually conjure up a specific episode to actually recollect that information. So this does seem to be maintained with age. So while it may sound like we're doomed, um, I'm hoping that you'll agree with me after I speak to you that there is a large body of research that, su that suggests otherwise, and that while we certainly experience decline in numerous areas as we age, we also experience stability and sometimes improvement. So in this talk, I'm going to address several questions that we're looking at in my lab. The first one is what happens to the brain and cognition as we age, so our thinking ability as we age. I'll then address how does the brain adapt to age-related changes, and how can we encourage age-related compensation? So let's begin with what happens to the brain and cognition as we age. And we'll start with the brain. So when we age, we experience changes to gray matter, which is made up of brain cells or neurons, and also to white matter, which connects those collections of neurons. Some brain regions actually um, endure greater loss than others with, age, with healthy aging. And reduced communication between regions um, is due to a number of factors, one of which relates to a loss of white matter integrity, so those connections between those collections of neurons. And another factor that reduces um, communication amongst brain regions is a reduction in the efficacy of neurotransmitters, especially dopamine and serotonin, which you've probably heard about. I'm not going to focus on those today, but just so you're aware. We also experience reduced blood flow due to narrowing of the arteries. So this actually reduces the um, ability for brain regions to benefit from oxygen and other nutrients. We experience increased damage from uh, free radicals in the brain. And we know that antioxidants um, can combat those effects. And we also experience increased inflammation. So we know that in the body, um, Inflammation is a reaction to injury or disease or some change in our environment or our, our brain state um, or body state that is unusual. And so there is a belief that inflammation relates to some of our age-related changes, some of which I'll speak to you about. 
So I mentioned to you that there are reductions to certain parts of the brain, more so than others. And two regions that seem to be particularly vulnerable to the effects of aging include prefrontal cortex, it's over here, and a region that's tucked within the temporal lobes of the brain uh, known as the hippocampus, known for its, its name is actually Latin for seahorse um, because of its shape. And it's actually a very primitive structure. I am going to focus on the functioning of the hippocampus today. So we do see a reduction in volume within these regions, but the reduction is gradual. And it begins in our 30s or 40s, so those of you who are um, younger in the audience um, should be aware of this. You know, there are some preventative uh, factors that I'll talk about that are important to implement even in young age. Now, there is a question, of course, of how changes in brain volume translate into actual cognitive decline. And I mentioned to you already that the decline affects some abilities, but not all abilities. The abilities that it seems to affect are grouped together as part of fluid intelligence. <laughs> And fluid intelligence refers to our ability to reason about complex information that is not um, related to information that we learned in the classroom, for example. It's our flexible ability to work with information such as working memory, so keeping online information in order to manipulate um, that information to solve a problem. Fluid intelligence also includes strategies in order to remember information better. So what I'm going to talk about is episodic memory and the strategies in order to um, enhance our episodic memory. But the types of, uh, so some areas that seem to remain stable um, are grouped together under crystallized intelligence. So this is our stored knowledge. So being well read would be uh, part of this. And this includes semantic memory, uh, which I had mentioned to you before, uh, facts about the world and about ourself that are not specific to any time or place. They're context independent. So I'd like to take a closer look at one area of decline, and this is episodic memory. Before I tell you about how episodic memory declines, I want to mention to you that a lot of what we know about memory comes from the detailed study of single neurological cases. And much of the work that I do actually involves single neurological cases and groups of cases. The most famous amnesic case that has been studied is uh, the case of H.M., Henry Malaysen, who actually passed away a number of years ago. And H.M. underwent bilateral resection, so surgical removal, of his hippocampus in both hemispheres. And actually, not only the hippocampus, but regions that are adjacent to it that are now known to be involved in certain types of memory. The surgery was performed to relieve HM of intractable epilepsy, so epilepsy that could not be treated by normal pharmaceutical <laughs> intervention. It was an experimental surgery and left HM, unfortunately, with a very profound amnesia, and the surgery was never performed again. But luckily for, I mean, not for, unfortunately for him, but very uh, fortunate for us, we learned a lot about the direct connection between the hippocampus and the formation and storage of memory. So HM, so this would be the time of his surgery, was unable to acquire new information from the time of his surgery, and specifically information that's consciously ex accessible. That's what we call explicit memory. But he was also unable to retain information from prior to the surgery. And this is known as a retrograde amnesia. Interestingly, you see this kind of curve and this is percentage of normal memory. This is just kind of a hypothetical situation, um, but very true in HM and in some other patients is the fact that, um, or the observation that, memories that were formed long ago are retained to a greater extent than memories that were formed more recently and closer in time to the time of lesion or injury or surgical removal in this case. And you'll see that um, this pattern applies to some types of memory, but not others. A person who I had the privilege of working with for many years, and unfortunately passed away uh, about two years ago, is the case KC, Kent Cochran. And Kent Cochran actually taught us something more detailed about how the hippocampus contributes to memory. So Kent um, suffered massive 
uh, damaged his brain as a result of a closed head injury due to a motorcycle accident. And despite this widespread damage, he actually showed a very interesting dissociation between an area of impaired memory and an area of spared memory. His episodic memory for all times in his life, whether it was remote, so from very long ago, or memories that were formed more recently were completely wiped out. And really, uh, to really believe or understand this, um, you really need to see a demonstration from um, a person like this. I present this photo because it really illustrates uh, the deficits and areas of preservation that he exhibited. So here Kent is describing what he sees in family photos. And he knows the people in the photos, so that's a type of semantic memory. He knows where the photos were taken. They're of events that he experienced, but he could not tell you anything beyond what he saw in the pictures. So it was as though he didn't actually um, experience those events. And so this really does show us a distinction between impaired episodic memory and intact semantic memory. I did mention to you that uh, Kent had suffered from widespread damage to his brain and connections between brain regions due to this closed head injury. So it's unclear, based on him at least, whether episodic memory is directly connected to the hippocampal damage that he experienced. So in order to study this, what we did was we um, we had actually the opportunity to test a number of individuals with varying amounts of hippocampal damage. Some of them had damage that was selective to the hippocampus and did not affect other regions. Other patients had damage that extended into other regions of the brain. And we tested them on what we call the autobiographical interview. It's a method where we ask participants to retrieve memories from five life periods, from childhood, adolescence all the way through to the past year. And then we uh, count the number of details that are retrieved and we classify those details according to whether they're episodic and specific to the event itself or non-episodic, including semantic details and repetitions and so on. And what we found is that patients who had very selective but complete damage to the hippocampus and no damage elsewhere or little damage elsewhere were the most impaired relative to other patients and healthy controls. So other patients who had less extensive hippocampal damage, but damage to other parts of the brain. And this is what you see here. So this patient here had the most selective hippocampal lesions in both hemispheres and had the most profound um, deficit. He was unable to generate um, many details for each life period. Uh, with some probing, he did a little better, but he was nowhere near the controls performance. These are age-matched, healthy adults um, who are also close in education to the patient, and there's a major difference at all time periods. A very interesting feature that was discovered in KC was that not only was his episodic memory impaired, but it turns out that he was also unable to imagine details of future events. And this relates to events that he had not experienced, but that were plausible in the context of his life. This has been a really hot topic in the area of cognitive neuroscience, which is the area that I study. Um, and it has actually been demonstrated not only in neuroimaging studies, where the hippocampus seems to be, it lights up or it's most activated um, during uh, tests of future imagining when people retrieve, or not retrieve, but they generate or construct um, narratives of events that they might participate in, but also based on a number of cases that have been studied systematically. What I wanted to highlight is that even in healthy aging, we find that there's a decline in our ability to describe events that we might experience in the future. Now, this might not really affect us in day-to-day -day life, um, but just so you know, there is a, a decrease in the amount of specificity relating to um, future events and past events. My student, John Aquan, a PhD student, who's actually uh, close to graduating, um, tested a number of other cases. And I just wanted to uh, mention this because uh, we used a very similar method to that used in the autobiographical interview, where we ask participants, uh, patients and healthy adults who are matched in age and education, um, to generate details of events that they might experience, both in the near future and the distant future. And here are the controls performance. And you can see that they're generating about 35 to 40 details on average 
per event, whereas our patients are generating very few episodic-like details. And KC was unable to generate any details. So does this imply that amnesic cases are stuck in a permanent present? This is a very common analogy that's used, or metaphor that's used, I should say, um, with respect to amnesic people. And even the biography, the very recent biography of HM, written by Sue Corkin, alludes to this. It was actually titled Permanent Present Tense. So how accurate is this? And so we decided to investigate this question um, by using a paradigm that is uh, very prominent in the behavioral economics literature. The reason, I'll, I'll describe the paradigm in a moment, but one of the issues with interview methods is that it places heavy demands on our ability to actually construct narratives and to generate details, independent of whether those narratives are from the past or from the future. So we used a paradigm, it's a, it's a test of intertemporal choice, which does not require constructive ability, and participants are asked whether they would prefer to accept an immediate reward, a smaller immediate reward, or a larger later reward. And in this paradigm, we vary the amount of delay between receipt of the immediate versus delayed reward. It's varied from one week all the way to 10 years. There's actually seven delays. And we also vary the amount of the immediate reward from 50 and then close to $100 in this case, we also use a larger uh, $2,000 uh, future reward. And in, this is actually a very robust phenomenon. What we find in not only humans, but even in non-human uh, primates, even in pigeons actually, not, not with money of course, um, <laughs> is that uh, there's a normal tendency to discount the value of the larger future reward with increasing delay. So that makes sense. I mean, if you have to wait longer, you're more re you're, you would more readily accept the immediate reward. And also, if the immediate reward is larger, you're more, re you're more um, apt to uh, accept it. We tested a large group of young and older adults on this, healthy older adults, and we found that there was no significant difference between the ability to, well, actually, sorry, um, in this discounting curve. So, um, in fact, young and older adults discounted the value of the larger future reward to a greater extent with increasing delay. Um, the young are represented by the open triangles and the older by the uh, closed squares. There is no significant difference, but if anything, the older adults, there's a trend towards them uh, discounting the future less deeply, which indicates that they are showing regard for, for the future. Um, we've actually also investigated this in amnesic people with um, extensive hippocampal damage, and they also don't show any difference from healthy controls. So this suggests that even though individuals might have a decline in future imagining if the hippocampus is compromised, especially well, in terms of function, um, there's still, uh, we still see preservation in other aspects of future decision making. One, uh, one uh, point that I wanted to make, though, is that in both cases, in the case of older adults and also amnesic patients, it is not necessarily uh, the case that those individuals are applying the same strategy to engage in discounting um, uh, compared to that of the younger adults. So one question is whether those older adults and also uh, people with hippocampal damage um, are actually compensating and perhaps their brain and their cognitive function is adapting to age-related changes. So the next question I wanted to address today is how does the brain adapt to um, age-related age changes? We know that aging brains are not necessarily declining brains. So when the brain is healthy, cognitive deficits are less pronounced. And I'm sure you've read a lot about this in the media. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the mechanisms and, uh, and then ways to actually prevent or, or encourage uh, compensation. So we do know that age matters, but we also know that brain health matters more. And the mechanism by which this is thought to occur is uh, through plasticity and or neural compensation. Um, these refer to the abilities to flexibly recruit different brain structures or systems to take over the function of old ones. So the belief is that the brain can reorganize itself 
to compensate for loss, for structural loss, and in so doing, our cognitive function is preserved. Now, in order to investigate neural compensation, we need a method to actually visualize changes in the healthy living brain. And one way of doing so is to actually um, rely on methods like uh, magnetic resonance imaging. You're probably familiar with this method in terms of its diagnostic value for um, looking at the structure of a brain, but you can actually use this method to investigate the function of the brain. So it's very, um, it's actually widely used, uh, this method of functional MRI. And basically, what we're doing is we're detecting changes in brain function based on blood flow, so measures of blood flow, they're indirect measures, um, while a participant is in the scanner actually engaging in a task, like a memory task. And this is kind of a summary of a number of studies that have compared older adults to younger adults. This happens to be an example of tube memory tests, and what is found is that older adults who are performing in the same way, so the performance is indistinguishable from younger adults, show a different pattern of activation of brain regions. So the younger adults are activating, well in this case it's a word pair cued recall test, so it's just a test in which the participants were learning lists of words, and they're activating regions of prefrontal cortex and actually the medial temporal lobe on the left side. In older adults, the same regions are activated, but in both sides of the brain, so bilaterally. And we find this across different tasks. They don't have to be verbal, and um, it's a very pervasive finding. Of course, what does this exactly mean um, is unclear, but it's thought that it represents the ability of the brain to compensate by, um, by engaging regions that would not normally be engaged in young adulthood. So, in addition to good genes and education, researchers have identified factors that can help us to um, improve our cognitive function and to induce um, plasticity and neural compensation. And this brings me to the final question of my talk, which is, how can we encourage age-related compensation? How can we improve um, our aging mind, or at least prevent its decline into dementia. So you're probably familiar with lifestyle factors and also with um, possibly environmental factors that can be, so actually measures that can be taken um, as preventative, and I will mention these to you today. And then there's also cognitive strategies if we're actually faced with decline, there are cognitive strategies, um, I'm gonna speak to you about memory strategies, that can be applied to improve our memory when um, we're otherwise not performing as well as we used to. So you're probably familiar with uh, slogans, or you've seen slogans, uh, indicating that we really have to practice methods in order to reduce our stress. There is a lot of uh, recent research that suggests that this, is, uh, this holds in the literature or that, there, that this is empirically based. Um, meditation does allow us to reduce our stress um, and uh, actually reduces um, stress hormones, which when uh, active in a chronic state can have very neurotoxic effects on hippocampal function. We also know that social interaction is very important. Um, we know that older adults who are living alone are one of the most impoverished and vulnerable parts of society. And this may be because um, of the fact that they're alone and not engaged in social interaction. It might also have to do with their living environment, with poverty, and a general lack of social support. So it is very important to surround yourselves um, with uh, people who are supportive and who you find common bonds with. A healthy diet, I'm sure you've heard a lot about this. I had to put this up. <laughs> Um, there, is, there is a very clear link between increased sugars and bad fats, and you've heard a lot about, uh, I'm sure, bacon and, uh, and other types of foods that um, might even be carcinogenic. But whether or not they are, we believe that they are, but uh, regardless, they also are associated with a decline in cognitive function. 
And so it is very important to reduce um, our intake of these kinds of foods and also to increase our intake of foods that have antioxidant properties. I'm sure you're aware of those types of foods. And I mentioned to you that antioxidants do uh, reduce free radicals in the brain, um, which are uh, very strongly linked to uh, cognitive decline. Research also indicates that regular aerobic exercise, which increases cardiovascular health, can actually directly enhance memory and learning. There are animal studies showing this direct link, and even some human studies. I'm going to give you an example of one human study that was actually conducted by another research group. And what they did was they had a large sample of older adults, 120 older adults, who were randomly assigned to one of two groups. One group was an aerobic exercise group, and the other one was a strengthening and toning group as a kind of control. And they tested these individuals on a variety of tests. One of the tests that I'm presenting you, to you here is a, a spatial working memory test, where the participants had to hold online the location, well, in memory, the location of a dot, and then decide whether it matched or didn't match um, the previous location that they were presented with following a delay. And what the researchers found was that there was an increase in hippocampal volume. So these individuals were scanned with structural MRI, and their hippocampus was measured, the size of it. They found that there was an increase, a steady increase, with continued um, aerobic exercise. And this was exercise of moderate intensity uh, three times a week. They found this at six months, and especially at a year. And they found that this increase in hippocampal volume was significantly correlated with the ability to perform well on that spatial working memory test. And the mechanism that is believed to underlie this effect is what is called neurogenesis. This is our prolifer proliferation of new cells as we, as we age, actually. So it's actually the case we know now that um, what we're born with, the number of cells that we're born with, is not, um, is not static that we actually do um, grow new cells as we age, and there may be some functional relevance to that. And there's some studies looking at this um, now, especially in animal models, but also in humans. So we know that exercise, of course, is very important. So the preventative factors that I mentioned are examples of engagement and also of environmental enrichment. Engagement in enjoyable tasks that demand sustained mental effort what we call cognitive exercise, do lead to gains in cognitive performance. And these could include learning a new language or even learning a challenging game, educational outings, and of course, participating in research. And I'm going to speak to you at the end about that. I know it's a little plug, but, um, <laughs> but uh, there are uh, benefits to being engaged in these various ways. Um, I'm not going to speak about video games, but if you'd like, at the very end, I'm happy to talk to you about some of those brain games that, um, that people have been, well, that, that are actually very uh, popular nowadays. Environmental enrichment refers to settings in which individuals experience enhanced cognitive and social interaction, as well as enhanced sensory and uh, motor abilities, leading also to improved learning and memory. And I'm going to show you an example of something that we've been doing. Um, so in, I actually also study spatial memory, so our ability to navigate the world. The reason I study this is because the hippocampus is also very sensitive to this ability, or, or seems to be at the center of this ability. So that's just an aside. Um, what we created to study spatial memory is, well, this is a typical maze that's used in rodents. It's a plus maze. We created what we call the village maze. It's actually an enriched environment. Um, with multiple locations, two levels, um, there's social interaction, there's actually, that's a male uh, rat, there's a female rat in the maze. Um, so there, is, uh, there are all these different opportunities for the rat to be engaged. And we find that after extensive training in this maze, rats who have hippocampal lesions, so we actually look at Alzheimer's models, um, retain the ability to navigate in this maze which is actually, I don't want to say groundbreaking, but compared to previous research, it's quite surprising. 
So this does indicate that environmental enrichment can lead to improved learning and memory. And we've shown this across many different studies. And we've also shown this in old rats versus young rats without, hippocamp without, without hippocampal lesions. Um, and we also know that, based on other studies, that environmental enrichment actually leads to uh, neurogenesis, so an increase in uh, new cells. Okay, so I mentioned to you um, some preventative methods, but I'd also like to talk a little bit about compensatory me methods. So what happens if we are faced with decline, which is, an, I don't want to say inevitable, but quite likely as we age. And one effect that we've studied in the lab is known as the self-reference effect. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. It might be something that you'd like to take home with you. So this is a type of memory strategy that has been studied actually for um, a little over a decade. And it refers to um, enhanced memory for information that is encoded through self-referential or self-related processing. So thinking about information in relation to the self is a very deep way of processing information and leads to uh, better memory. And it, it seems intuitive, um, but it has been tested in a variety of ways. The most typical uh, way of testing this, so if you, you know, want to know a little bit about what happens in the lab, is um, using a word, a word list um, memory test where participants at study are presented with a long list of words, usually between 90 and 120 words. They're not even told that they're going to be tested later on for their memory for the list. What they are told is um, the way in which they should think about the word. So in one condition, which we call the structural condition, it's a very shallow way of processing, participants are asked to think about whether the word contains an E in it. So you're not really thinking much about the meaning. You're not processing the word very deeply. In another condition, which is a semantic condition, you are thinking about the meaning, and you're asked whether the word describes a desirable trait. So of course, all of these words are trait adjectives. And then finally, in a third condition, you're asked whether the word actually describes something about yourself. And as you can imagine, across many studies, both younger adults and older adults, and even individuals with neurological compromise, perform much better in recalling the words and recognizing the words if they were um, studied in this self-referential way, in this deeper type of process, with this deeper type of processing. One of my graduate students, Nicole Carson, she's also nearing the end of her PhD, she decided that perhaps, you know, it's, it's wonderful that we see these benef benefits of processing information in reference to the self, but does this really apply to the real world? And how can we make this task more ecologically valid? So what she did was she generated different types of narratives relating to um, experience, day-to-day -day experiences. Some of them are somewhat mundane, some are not. Um, and she presented these to participants, a large group of young and older participants. And the participants were asked to read the scenario and then make a judgment. In some cases, they were asked whether it is easy to imagine themselves in that particular scenario. So that was the self-reference uh, condition. In another condition, they were asked whether that uh, scenario was a po represents a positive event. So that's a less deep way of processing the, uh, the narrative. And then finally, they were asked whether the word the appears more than four times. So a much shallower way of processing the, uh, the scenario. And just so you know, there were 36 different scenarios. None of them were presented more than once. Um, and they were randomly intermixed. And what we found was, in fact, a self-reference effect. And I'm just showing you the data from older adults. But what you see here is that, in fact, uh, participants did quite well um, in general. Um, but they were, they were recognizing uh, approximately 80% of the uh, details from these events relative to when the condition was semantic and especially compared to the structural condition. So they were benefiting from the self-referential processing that was asked of them. We have applied similar strategies to, um, to help people improve on other, other areas of cognitive performance. 
and I had already presented to you the test of intertemporal choice, so deciding between taking an immediate reward versus a larger reward. And we were wondering what would happen if people were asked um, to make the reward more meaningful. And we interviewed family members of every participant. We tested healthy young people, we tested healthy older adults, we tested individuals with hippocampal damage, and we presented them based on a detailed interview with a family member, cues relating to the receipt of the larger later reward. So in this case, a participant was um, intending on, uh, was going to actually celebrate his or her 40th wedding anniversary. And so we asked that person to imagine experiencing that when they were to receive the larger later reward. And what we found, even though um, there was no difference between young and older adults in terms of their performance, we found that this manipulation, which is adding personal meaningfulness to the task, actually improved their, um, their I guess, or their propensity to um, orient towards the future and accept a larger uh, future reward. And so their subjective valuing of the immediate reward, uh, of the larger future reward is, was actually increased. So this is the original performance of young and older adults, and this is the boost in performance that you see in young and older adults when they're presented with personally significant scenarios. So just to conclude, we do see age-related changes in the brain. I hope, I don't think I had to convince you of that. Um, we do see areas of, of cognitive decline, but we also see areas of preservation and even improvement. We know that the brain can adapt to age-related changes, and this leads to preserved function. And some of this is known to be directly a as known to be a direct result of um, internal phenomena such as neurogenesis. So this is the growth of new cells or new neurons. There are clear methods of preventing and compensating for age-related cognitive decline. And um, I think one other reason for using um, the title that I used is that there are actually quite a few references to memory in the song. And also, um, you may or may not know that there was a whole first verse in the song that was omitted. And it relates to the fourth dimension that was studied by Einstein, time. Um, so, uh, I hope that uh, you'll remember some of the uh, points that I raised, <laughs> and I, I hope so. Um, they are personally meaningful to hopefully some of you. And I, I just again wanted to thank not only uh, lab members and especially Donna Kwan and Nicole Carson, but also my collaborators. I work with individuals at York, at Baycrest, and also at Washington University in St. Louis, um, especially on the behavioral economics uh, paradigms. And then finally, my plug, <laughs> I told you I would mention this. Um, I, I also wanted to thank the research participants. We study, we test many, many individuals. Um, we do find, uh, or they find, I think, that uh, the experience is engaging. And very recently, there was um, an organized research unit that was developed, Why You Care. And uh, I'm, I'm affiliated with this uh, ORU. So are some wonderful other researchers who study aging in the brain at York University. So if you are interested in participating in future studies, um, you can contact us. I'm happy to also give you my card if you'd like at the end. And um, I just wanted to thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you.